Let us bow our heads for prayer. Your Father, thank you for this ongoing study uh, on suffering and pain uh, in the Christian life, a very real experience we all will go through, and the comforting and consoling principles that you've learned in the scriptures. As we look at uh, the subject in light of meekness, we again implore that the Holy Spirit minister to our hearts that we might seek better understanding and mature in our faith, be closerly drawn to you, and by doing so, dear Father, find our Christian lives more meaningful and delightful in you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So we come to uh, <clears throat> our lesson, Lesson 10, uh, Meekness in the Crucible. And <clears throat> when I saw the title, it reminded me of this very, very popular video. It's a video clip. As you can see, there's over 7 million hits. This is a rendition of It Is Well With My Soul by Wentley Phipps uh, in the gather, uh, gathering of musicians. And before he sang the song, and it, it will move you if you listen to the song, he said this. Uh, I can still see the video panning into the face of Buddy Green, who composed Mary Did You Know with uh, Mark Laurie, because he was part of that. But he said, uh, Amen. You, know, you can read it in his lips after Wentley said this. It is in the quiet crucible of your personal, private sufferings that your noblest dreams are born and God's greatest gifts are given in compensation for what you've been through. And of course, he started singing the song, It is well with my soul and peace like a river. A uh, song, as you know, if you know the background of the hymn, written in the face of tragedy. So we confront <clears throat> tragedy and suffering and pain in the Christian life once more. <clears throat> and like we said in the prayer, it will be studied in the light of meekness. <clears throat> the quarterly gives this definition, a dictionary definition of meekness. It's an adjective, and if you break down the entries for the definition, it can be an enduring injury with patience and without resentment. So it means mild, um, deficient in spirit and courage, uh, submissive, not violent or strong, moderate. And of course, since we're doing a Bible study, you don't want to stick to the dictionary definition. What you want to do <clears throat> is go to the definition that we find in the scriptures. Firstly, we got to guard uh, against a mis misconception, a misunderstanding of, of uh, meekness. Uh, there is this uh, dependent organization of really meek and timid souls <laughs> that was organized. And of course, the acronym for the organization is doormats. They're saying, in order for you to be meek, you must be a doormat where everybody steps on you. I don't know if that's the definition and the understanding of meekness in the scriptures. So we're best off looking at the original language. And in Hebrew, anav is used to, be, to mean poor, afflicted, humble, and meek. This is the condition of people who are forced to be humble because of their lot in life. Uh, that's called anav. So meekness in the Old Testament, and now our anwa is from anav, uh, suffering, oppressed, afflicted, denoting the spirit produced under such experiences. Why? Because you are subject to poverty and you are marginalized and disenfranchised. You have no choice but to be humble and learn how to be lowly because of your lot in life. So we, we take the definition now into the Greek. The Greek Prowess means mild or gentle. It is also an adjective. And it will be useful for us to know these words from Hugo McCord, which was cited by William Barclay in his commentary. It says, when prowess was used of animals, the Greeks had the meaning of taming. When they used the word of sound, they meant it was gentle and soft. When they used it of persons, they meant the people were meek and gentle. 
So uh, in, in the vernacular, we call it ma'amo. Papaamo in mo ang isang hayop. A wild animal is tamed. So although the animal is still strong, the animal becomes tame. What's the meaning of taming an animal? The animal is subjected to a master so that the animal does not follow its instincts. It follows the command of the master. That way you become tame or domesticated. A wild horse, for instance, who was left in the wild just running uh, to his instincts is now tame so that he can follow the rider of the horse who will become the master. Now the noun form of this uh, word is priotes, which is meekness. This is the word that we see in Matthew 21, 5, when Jesus in the triumphal entry enters Jerusalem riding on an ass, sitting upon an ass, and called the fall of an ass. And the definition that we find for this word is temperate, displaying the right blend of force and reserve, or gentleness. Strength in gentleness avoids unnecessary harshness, yet without compromising or being too slow to use necessary force. So a right understanding of meekness in the scriptures is strength under control or strength in gentleness. Now, if we now look at the word in that light, it would be a lot easier to relate meekness into the pain and the suffering that we endure as Christians in our daily walk with the Lord. It's amazing that meekness and gentleness, according to George Bethume, one of the earlier scholars, Perhaps no grace is less prayed for or less cultivated than gentleness or meekness. Seldom do we reflect that not to be gentle is sin. You can talk about the graces and virtues in life, you know, and, and Christians pray for grace and virtues in their lives as they mature in the faith. But according to his observation, no grace is less prayed for or cultivated than the virtue of meekness. So we'd like to focus on meekness uh, in this lesson and understand how meekness can help us cope with the suffering and pain that we, uh, that we endure and we experience in our Christian walk. So it's easy enough. If we look at the lesson, I subdivided the, the lesson into three case studies on meekness. We will study Joseph, we will study Moses, and we will study Christ. And as we look at their meekness, we'll begin to understand how they were able to face uh, severe trials uh, in their lives and se severe hardship. So let's go to the story of Joseph's submission. Um, the first case study tells us that in submission, we will learn how to cope with very, very difficult circumstances in their lives. So let's review the story. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the robe of many colors that he wore, he wore, and they took him and threw him into a pit. The pit was empty. There was no water in it. Okay, so you know the story, Joseph had a uh, coat of many colors uh, done for him by his father. He, of course, he was a favorite son, and this generated a tremendous amount of jealousy among the brothers. And what they did was they grabbed Joseph one day because they really hated him. And then when they saw the Midianite traders passing by, they drew Joseph up from the pit where they threw him and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. So here we were sent by your father to give uh, food to your brothers. And instead of them appreciating your gesture, they throw you into a pit. To add insult to injury, they pull him out and they throw him to the traitors to get rid of him. So early on in the life of Joseph, life wasn't a good. It was very difficult for him to survive because of this tremendous hardship that has been wrought upon his life by his jealous brothers. But note what happened as the story goes on. The Lord was with Joseph. And he became a successful man, and he was in the house of his Egyptian master. Throughout the, the ordeal that he went through, the Lord was with Joseph. The presence 
of God was with Joseph that allowed him to go through the miseries and the hardships that he experienced. Uh, and you know, more testimony to the presence of the Lord in his life was the temptation that the wife of Potiphar uh, subjected him to. Uh, but he refused said, and said to his master's wife, how then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? You know, uh, because of Joseph, God blessing Joseph, Potiphar's household increased in abundance. And of course, the wife of Potiphar was attracted to Joseph and tried to make a move on him. And Joseph basically said he was not only sinning against his master, Potiphar, he was actually sinning against God if he succumbed. Which means that Joseph was constantly aware of the presence of God, which the presence of which directed his moves and his actions. So you know the story, after all the interpretation of the dream of the Pharaoh, Joseph suggested that they gather grain for seven years of plenty so that they will have a stock for the next seven years of want and famine. And then Pharaoh, after uh, learning this proposal from Joseph and the interpretation of his dream, said to Joseph, you shall be over my house and all my people shall order themselves as you command. Only as regards the throne will be I greater than you. So we look at this point, you know, thrown into a pit, pulled out to be sold to Midianite traders. You know, he was a piece of meat being thrown. He goes to Egypt and he rises to second in command in the entire Egyptian empire, the most powerful empire during his time. Now Joseph was governor over the land. And Joseph's brothers came and bowed themselves before him with their faces to the ground. So the same brothers who subjected him into all this pain and turmoil came because they were needing food. Otherwise, they will die. And of course, food was available in Egypt through the leadership of Joseph so they can buy grain there and bring it back to their families and they can survive. And when Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, it may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for all the evil that we did to him. <clears throat> okay, so let's contract the story. You know what happened, right? After Joseph reveals himself to his brothers, uh, he asked uh, his father Jacob to move into Egypt so that he can take care of them. So the entire family moved into Egypt. And of course, after they moved to Goshen, uh, Jacob died, and Joseph uh, asked the Pharaoh if he can bury his father in the way he was instructed to do so. And as soon as the father died, the brothers got so worried. He said, oh, it can be that Joseph will seek vengeance, and he will hate us and pay us back for all the evil that we did to him. So they went to Joseph and told them, you know, uh, the father, our father told us when he was still alive to come to you so that you do not pay back what we did to you. But Joseph said to them, do not fear, for, I, for am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So do not fear, I will provide for you and your little ones. Thus he com comforted them and spoke kindly to them. So here is Joseph, the governor of Egypt, second in command, uh, second, the second most powerful man in the kingdom, who had all the means, all the power to avenge the inequities and the uh, the atrocities that his, his brothers did to him. But he did not. Why did he not avenge the sufferings he was subjected to by his brother? What did he say? Do not fear, for I am in the place of God. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. He was in total submission to the sovereignty of God. He said, he never, <laughs> at least when you read the scriptures, he didn't ask, Lord, why did you allow my brother to throw me in the pit, be sold to the Midianites, and be thrown here in Egypt by myself? Never asked that, uh, but he completely submitted to the sovereignty of God. Of course, we can only tell that as we infer 
from the end of the beautiful story where Joseph forgave his brothers and comforted them. So here's a case study in meekness, a very powerful governor who can mete out justice the way it should have been meted out and yet he reneged and does not give the just treatment due to his brothers, but instead submitted himself to the will of God and the sovereignty of God and showed kindness to his brethren. Max Lucado had this to say, the next time you are called to suffer, pay attention. It may be the closest you'll ever get to God. I would not doubt it for a moment that uh, because God was with Joseph, as we read, the suffering that he went through drew, drew him closest to God in his life. You know, when you are at your wit's end and you don't know what to do, you go to God. And like Max Lucado so incisively observed, next time you suffer, <laughs> pay attention. Because that is the closest you'll ever get to God. God gives you suffering so that you can draw close to him. Here's where I love the song of Stephen Curtis Chapman. He's an, <laughs> he's an oldie but goodie. Uh, his title is Strength is Perfect. And there's part of the song that goes... When, truly we, when we truly see how deep our weakness goes, His strength in us begins. His strength is perfect when our strength is gone. He'll carry us when we can carry on. How was Joseph? When he was at his wit's end, uh, when his strength was gone, he trusted in God and His sovereignty, and God blessed him and like some Bible commentators said, whatever Joseph touched, it turned into gold because God was with him. I think the take home for this first case study in meekness is summarized by Thomas Watson. Meekness toward other people consists of three things. The bearing of injuries, like Joseph did. The forgiving of those injuries, like he did as well and the returning of goods for evil. This is where weakness comes. He was injured, he was subjected to pain, and yet he bore that injury and he forgave those who afflicted them with those injuries. And instead of avenging the unfairness that was meted out to him, he returned good for evil. So in the first case study, how do you combat suffering and pain in your life? Be totally submitted to God's sovereignty. And in the end, you will see how wise he is in orchestrating things so that people might benefit from the circumstances that he allowed to happen. The second case study that we have is Moses' intercession. Whereas Joseph submitted to the sovereignty of God, we see Moses interceding for his people. Let's go back to the story. Exodus 32, 19. And as soon as he came near the camp and saw the calf and dancing, Moses' anger burned hot, and he threw the tablets out of his hands and broke them at the foot of the mountain. It was taking long for Moses to show up after he ascended Mount Sinai to commune with God and receive the tables of stones, which is the Decalogue. And... Uh, Children of Israel got so impatient. He said, Moses will not come back anymore. We really don't have a God here in the wilderness. What will happen is we need a God. So they formed the God out of gold, a golden calf. We talk about them and subjected them, said their, themselves to idolatry. And then God says, I have seen this people and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now, therefore, therefore, let me alone that my wrath may turn hot against them and I may consume them in order that I may make a great nation of you. <laughs> Watch this. Uh, the, the Old Testament says Moses was the meekest man in all the earth. He was the most patient man. But I think uh, if we zero in in this circumstance, we will understand how great the meekness of Moses was. It came to a point where God was so upset with the children of Israel because they were committing idolatry despite his mighty hand that delivered them from Egyptian bondage. 
started worshiping a golden calf. And he told Moses, this people are stiff-necked people. You know what? I will consume them. I will destroy all of them. And uh, I will make of you a great nation. Has this happened before? You know, the flood. Uh, God sent the flood to wipe out the entire world and just preserve Noah and his family. And the reason why God did that was basically to know that even in the midst of judgment, grace will still be available. So in this particular case, he said, I'm ready to wipe out all these people. And Moses, of course, instead of saying, yeah, 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 they've been gossiping, they're backbiting, they're doing all some murmuring and complaining to me. Every day, complain, complain, complain. That's all I hear. Might as well get rid of them. That's not what Moses did. Here is how he reacted. In Exodus 3 to 11, it says, O oh Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people, whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt, and with great power and with the mighty hand? So here is the appeal of Moses. Oh Lord, why are you mad at your people? These, these are the people you brought out of the land of slavery in Egypt with your mighty hand. Why then should the Egyptians say with evil intent did he bring them out to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your burning anger and will then from this disaster against your people. Uh, so Moses was basically saying, Lord, if you wipe out the children of Israel, what will the Egyptians say? Oh, you, you went to, to all the ten last ten plagues so that they can be released and delivered from their bondage. And then the Egyptians say, you delivered them, you freed them, emancipated them so they can only be killed by you in the wilderness? What's up with that? You know, that doesn't, doesn't jive with what kind of God you are. And then, of course, Moses added this. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, to whom you swore by your own self and said to them, I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven, and all this land that I have promised will give to your offspring, and they shall inherit it forever. Okay, so Moses is saying, God, you, you delivered the people, your people from Egyptian bondage with the mighty hand, with mighty miracles, the crossing of the Red Sea, the ten plagues. Why will you then get rid of them? And then remember, these are a people because of the covenant established with Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. You know, there will be a great nation. This is the nation that you promised their forefathers. So relent and, and do not wipe them out. In fact, it became very involved, if you read later in the chapter, Moses says, alas, this people has sinned a great sin. They have made for themselves gods of gold. But now, if you will forgive their sin, but if not, please blot me out of your book that you have written. This is true intercession. Moses was willing to be blotted out of the book of God as long as God preserves the children of Israel who has been murmuring and complaining against him. So this is a strength of meekness in front of an exasperating experience, stiff-necked people who gave you a hard time, who makes you suffer and subject you to pain every day, instead of seeking to destroy them and agreeing with God, Moses said, no, if, if you need to, just get rid of me, just save the people. It's amazing that uh, Moses had the children of Israel, the entire people at his fingertips, if he only said so, the entire children of Israel would have been wiped out by God. That's strength. But he controlled that strength because he was meek. It reminds us of the prayer of Daniel, and I think this was behind the mind of Moses while he was praying to God. In Daniel 9, 18, it says, Daniel prays, open your eyes and see our desolations and the city that is called by your name. For we do not present our, our pleas before you because of our righteousness, but because of your great mercy. He starts with this. Daniel is saying, no, we're not coming to you because we have a righteousness to be proud of or a righteousness that we can present to you. No, we are coming to you because of your great mercy. The only way we can come to you and you can hear us is through your mercy, your great, great mercy. And then he continues, the next verse, 
O Lord, hear, O Lord, forgive, O Lord, pay attention and act. Delay not for your own sake, O my God, because your city and your people are called by your name. Daniel 9.19. So the prayer that the intercessory prayer of Daniel was offered for the sake of God, not for the sake of Daniel or the Israelites. So intercession comes into play when we suffer. And instead of being filled with self-pity and looking at your discouraging and almost pathetic life because of the pain and suffering that you go through, you will not think of that. Instead, you will think of the other fellow. You will think of others, others' sake, and their others' benefit, and in the process, intercedes for them. And through that, you will display extraordinary meekness, and that meekness will allow you to cope with the suffering and pain that goes through your life. William Barclay puts it so nicely, of the bliss of the man who is always angry at the right time and never angry at the wrong time, who has every instinct and impulse and passion under control because he himself is God-controlled. So Moses was not just a man of stature and of power. Moses was a man concerned for his people. And he interceded in their behalf so that they can be spared. Again, you see meekness coming in, strength and power under control. Takes us to the next case study. Of course, which is the penultimate case study in meekness. It is the compassion of Jesus. Whereas we saw Joseph's submission to God who was constantly present in his life. And we saw Moses' intercession, despite God's uh, uh, move towards justice and righteousness to, to somehow rectify the idolatry of his nation, of his people. Uh, Moses didn't think about himself. He interceded. And there's a very big connection and the link between your willingness to intercede for others, thinking about others, and your ability to cope with pain and suffering in your life. And of course, lastly, it's very important uh, coping mechanism for pain and suffering is Jesus' compassion. Case study of Jesus. Let's review what we see in Jesus. Remember uh, John 18, 6 at the, in the Garden of Gethsemane during the arrest of Jesus. The temple police were there deployed by the religious leaders so they can arrest Jesus. And this is very important because uh, it would be a very interesting study if you get the tetragrammaton. The tetragrammaton is yod hey vat hey, the unpronounceable, unspeakable name of God in the Old Testament. You know, why uh, H-W-H? We kind of <laughs> transliterate that into Yahweh, but in the Old Testament, they did not dare pronounce that name. They actually use Adonai or Elohim instead. So they, we started this before when somebody stands in the synagogue and there's a reading from the Torah. There is a portion of the Torah that you're supposed to read and there's notes on the margin that say you, when you come to this word, don't read this word, use this word instead. And the moment they come up with the tetragrammaton, yod hei vatei, they find either Elohim or they find Adonai. So that name is the name of God, the name of the true God. Okay. And it so happens that when you go to John 18, 6, God, the Son, Jesus himself, uses the tetragrammaton when they were asking for him. He said, I am. I am the one you're looking for. And as soon as he said, I am, the eternal infinitive, they do towards the back and fell. It's almost like giving, getting a very big ball and dropping it in a swimming pool. You know, when you drop the big ball, the water will drew back, you know, and splash. And that's what happened. They were like waves. When Jesus proclaimed that he was God, he was yod hei Vatei, they drew back. They fell back. That was, the, that was how powerful the words of Jesus was, okay? And then, you know, the story... Uh, Peter draws his sword, cuts off Malchus' ear, and Jesus 
puts back the ear miraculously. And this is what he said. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my father and he will at once send me more than 12 legions of angels? You say, I am not weak. It's not that I don't want to fight and I don't have the power to fight. Don't you understand that in a moment's notice, I can tell my father to send me 12 legions of angels. What does that imply? I always give this illustration when we did the book study on Isaiah several quarters ago. He said, the angel of the Lord went out and struck down 185,000 in the camp of the Assyrians. And when people arose early in the morning, behold, these were all dead bodies. Then Sennacherib, king Assyria of Assyria, departed and returned home and, leave, and lived at Nineveh. I don't want to go through the details. We went through that before. This is an amazing story. There is historical documentation for this. The very fierce and cruel king of Assyria, Sennacherib, who, who just... Uh, thrashes all of his uh, companions, destroys all cities. He had no choice but to turn back. Why? Because an angel of the Lord struck his army. One angel, 185,000. <laughs> Jesus is saying, I can call 12 legions of angels. Did Christ have power? You bet he had power. Even in the, lim the limits he subjected himself to when he was incarnated this man, Jesus had power to access from his father. But what did he do? Did he use the power to avenge himself, to get rid of the trouble? No. Says in John 10, 17 to 18, for this reason the father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. This charge I have received from my father. As powerful as Christ was, who can bring the entire Roman army to its knees because of the power he has from the Father. He did not wield his power to defend himself and escape his purpose of saving mankind. Instead, he laid down his life as the Father has commanded him, a charge given that brought delight and pleasure to the Father. That is meekness, the strength that was under control for the sake of the will of God. Remember when the Greeks were looking for Jesus Christ and they wanted to have a conversation with him. It was though during the last week of Christ on earth when he was then crucified. Jesus replied and said, the hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified and I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. So Jesus did not talk about the crucifixion here and the trials before Pilate and Herod and what have you. He's basically saying, hey, the time has come. What time? Says Jesus. It's a time for the Son of Man to be glorified. And he continues and said, for Christ also suffered once for sins the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. For, the, for this purpose, I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. This is said, signifying by what death he would die. So Christ's compassion at the basis. He was so intent in promoting and lifting up the glory of his father, the glory of God, that he was willing to go through the sufferings he went through. Like we said, for Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. So case study, Jesus Christ. Was he meek? Oh yes, he was very powerful, but he was meek. Why did he choose to put his strength under control and allow himself to suffer, even the suffering of death. Why? Because he was after the glory of God, so he can bring honor to the glory of God. Such compassion. And I think I can illustrate this with a very recent message that was delivered in PIC. This was delivered by Dr. Zeno Charles Marcel, the GC Associate Director for Health who gave the baccalaureate message for the graduating class of, of the medical school of AUP. 
uh, you should watch that. I think it was the July 23 when he preached. Uh, we were there, but we were in another part of Manila. But uh, since it was recorded, I had the privilege of listening. It's a very powerful message. But he basically started comparing competence and compassion. He's saying you can be a doctor and be a very competent doctor without showing compassion and it will hardly make a dent in your patients. So he cites an example that uh, in a recent study in John Hopkins University Oncology Clinic, a clinic for all those who are afflicted by cancers, uh, they randomized patients and, and then they took some of the doctors and gave them a script that said something like this. Hello, Mr. and Mrs. So-and-so. I know that by the end of our consultation today, I would be telling you some news that you didn't want to hear. But I want to let you know that I'm with you on this journey. Anything that you don't understand, I'll be willing to explain. I know some of what I'm going to tell you is going to be hard. But I am with you, I will not abandon you. So they, this was basically a script they gave to the cancer doctors in John Hopkins University. Now, of course, since it was a script, this did not come naturally from the doctors. But there was a, an experiment they conducted. They say, what happens if I approach the cancer patient and tell him this? They actually timed the script, and it was only 15 seconds. You know what the result was? They looked over time, and the individuals who had received a script recited by the physicians, and these patients used less medications, they had less symptoms, they had less frequent visits, and the overcost of their treatment was significantly lower, all because the doctor read the script that implied that he or she was compassionate. 15 seconds of a script made a world of a difference to cancer patients because compassion was shown alongside competence. That's meekness. Competence and compassion. What's the key to the script? If you heard the script, the script was the doctor's guarantee that despite the fact that you're going to go through the hard times of cancer, I will be with you. I will be there with you. The, uh, the underlying principle there is that there was a presence with those who were suffering. Otto de Bilius gives this very powerful quote. He says, God does not lead his children around hardship, but leads them straight through hardship. But he leads and amidst the hardship, he is nearer to them than ever before. Being a Christian doesn't mean you will have no suffering or pain. Being a Christian says you will have suffering, but in the suffering, the guarantee of God is he will, there, he will be there with you. He will never leave you, never forsake you. So we come to our conclusion. After looking at the three case studies, Joseph's submission to the sovereignty of God, Moses' intercession for his people, and Christ's compassion. And here we see the invitation of Jesus in Matthew 11, 28, 29, which we know so well. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your soul. Note the last part. Jesus is saying, you come to me, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, for I am meek and lowly in heart. I am meek. Look at the connection here. Jesus claims meekness, strength under control. And why, why, why? Because he invites us to take a yoke. You know what the yoke is? Like we studied this, the yoke is, is an attachment so that two animals, two beasts of burden can work together. That means they're joined together to help each other. That's why Jesus is saying, when I'm yoked with you, I will always be with you despite the hardship difficulties, the trials, the pain, the sufferings, I will be there with you, for I am meek and lowly in heart. This uh, nut has been put no better than what Kyle Norman said. Jesus is God with us in Matthew 1, 23. 
the incarnation means that there is no part of our lives, no matter how dark or ugly, where Jesus is not present. That's the good news. The meek and lowly Jesus, so powerful, with power under control, was with us. And because God was with us, there is no part of our lives, however dark or ugly, where he will not be there. And for that reason, we can find rest and peace in our meek and lowly Jesus, our Savior. I thought it proper to end our study with this striking phenomenon that has never been resolved. A lot of people think that was uh, one of the most devastating act of industrial espionage. Tylenol was the favorite uh, painkiller of a lot of Americans. And I remember vividly back in 1982 when there were seven people who died in Chicago because somebody was malicious enough to get the capsules of Tylenol and lace those capsules with cyanide. And in the span of a few days, seven people died because they were trying to remedy their pain. Instead of being remedied, they died of poisoning, the lethal poison of cyanide that was la uh, laced, that laced those capsules. They attempted to solve the problem for over 10 years. They tried to figure out who did the sabotage. They had some leads. They were never able to solve the problem. And eventually, the FBI said, we're clo casing, closing the case because we cannot resolve this case anymore. So it was one of the most devastating uh, um, infiltration and tampering of a of a, a very popular uh, medication that uh, happened in 1982 that somehow almost totally wiped out Tylenol in the pharmaceutical uh, market. A good thing about the Tylenol, the result was they now have damper resistant uh, you know, uh, packaging of all this over-the-counter medicine. You will see that now. And this went into the move of other canned goods and bottles. You got a tamper resistant. In other words, if th this is broken, you should not open it because somebody might have tampered with it and you might likely be harmed because of what has happened. But the reason why I share this with you is we all look for a painkiller because all of us will go through pain. Like uh, Gavin Anthony, the author of our lesson, has said. Um, we will go through pain and suffering as Christians. And we try to look for pain relievers in our lives. And the enemy gives us a ton of alternatives without telling us that those alternatives are laced with poison. Why? Because any solution to pain and suffering outside of God and the promise, presence of Jesus Christ will not bring you relief it will only bring you more pain and possibly poison you and you will die. Instead, I'd like to quote Billy Graham. Remember the Oklahoma bombing before 9-11? There was already a bombing that transpired in Oklahoma City. When he delivered this talk to comfort the residents of Louisiana, he said, I pray that you will not let bitterness and poison creep into your soul, but that you will turn in faith and trust in God even if we cannot understand. It is better to face something like this with God than without Him. I guess this is the trust of our message today. When you confront pain and suffering, and instead of running to God, you run away, you will be poisoned poisoned by unbearable pain, uh, unbearable times. Instead of running away from God, the counsel is to run to God because once you run to God, you will find relief and comfort and assurance. How? In terms of meekness, remember the models we studied today. 
you will learn to submit to the sovereignty of God like Joseph did, knowing that regardless of what happens in your life, even if you don't understand it, God has a purpose, things will work out for the good. And you're able to experience and go through all the pain and suffering that you're subjected to because God is in control. You are fully submitted to Him. And as we learn in the case of Moses' intercession, if your preoccupation during pain and suffering is not yourself, instead of wallowing in self-pity, you'd be more concerned about others. Even if they're the ones who subject, subjected you to pain, you intercede for them. Like Jesus is saying, love your enemies. Be obsessed in loving the other person because Jesus died for them in the first place. Intercede. The moment you intercede, that intercession, intercession is a powerful weapon to go against the pain and suffering that you're going through. And lastly, of course, we see the case study in Jesus' compassion. I still can't understand today how God, so powerful, up in heaven can condescend to become like men, not to wield his power and lord it over everybody, but instead subject himself to death and pain that we might be safe. What's the take home? If like Jesus, we will learn to humble ourselves and condescend to people, you know, instead of uh, very easily you can say, oh my, I'm having a tough time here in America, and they're saying the poorest citizen of America is richer than a ton of the residents of third world countries. Instead of thinking about that, you condescend to people and think more of people who need you and like Jesus, show compassion. And by showing compassion, you will be able to battle the pain and suffering in your life. Again, what kind of meekness did Jesus show? It was a combination of competence and compassion. He was strong, he was able to do it, and yet it was under control under the control of God, and because he was under the control of God, pain and suffering resulted in what Jesus called a peace that passes understanding. What did Jesus say? In this world you shall have trouble, but be of good cheer. I will overcome, I have overcome the world. So as we look into this lesson this week and look at meekness, I pray that you will grow in the knowledge and fear of God, and by doing so, God will give you more resources so that you can become more mature, more powerful, more, more qualified to do great things for Him. But in the middle of that qualification, you will learn to be meek and subject everything that you have in life to the control of God. And then you will have strength under control. You will learn what it means to be meek. And by doing so, you will be armed against the trials, the suffering, and pain in this life. Not to destroy you, but instead to draw you close to God and make you better understand how wise and gracious of a God we have. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Dear Father, thank you for this lesson that we studied this week. We keep on hammering on the problem of pain and suffering, which is so real, and we will go through this. But we've addressed the issue in terms of meekness. And, oh Lord, because we're your children, you have imbued us with power, extraordinary power, resurrection power from you. You gave us a lot of gifts, talents, and we can use for the Lord's work. And yet, if we submit ourselves to you, the Spirit will work meekness in our lives so that the power and the resources that we will have, that we have right now, that we possess, will not be used for our own sake or to better ourselves or defeat or overcome other people and exploit them, but rather we will use that power and submit it under your control and learn what meekness is all about. And in so doing, dear Father, we will stand against all the vicissitudes, the pain and suffering that we are subjected to. And like the scriptures has promised, we can even find inexpressible joy in the midst of the suffering. To this end, dear Father, bless us. And as we finish up this quarter, may we continually understand that regardless of the pain and suffering we go through, 
your promise still stands. I will never leave you nor forsake you. May that promise keep us this week as we face another walk with you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.